Good number of folks have uh, filtered on in after uh, Bible class, so always good to uh, good to have a good crowd uh, out. I know we've got a few people joining us online today, so I appreciate uh, the opportunity that we have to be able to broadcast our our services across the church Facebook page. Um, if you know somebody who uh, may be shut in and has uh, access to uh, Facebook but unable to make it uh, to services on Sunday morning, um, encourage them to, uh, to, uh, to join the church Facebook page and that way they can catch up with uh, Bible study and worship on Sunday mornings. Um, I do know that uh, we may have two or three or five or eight people join us on Sunday mornings on uh on the church Facebook page, I do usually check the videos a couple of a couple of days or even a week later, and we can reach up to 50 or 60 views. Uh, so that means we're spreading the word more uh, than just who is able to watch on Sunday morning. So uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to uh, to sp uh, spread the word out. You can share the videos and, and such um, if you'd like. So it's always good to know that we are uh, that we're spreading the gospel. And of course, we wouldn't have been doing this had it not been for COVID. So go figure. Uh, God made something good come out of something not so good. Uh, he has a tendency to do that. So uh, that's always great to, great to know. Uh, we're going to continue the lessons that we started last week. Uh, we're going to have uh, part one and part two of the marks of uh, true Christianity uh, over the next two weeks, uh, this week and next. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Romans chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8 this week, and we're going to be look, looking at verses 9 through the end of the chapter next week. Uh, because uh, we don't just have uh, little bits and pieces of the book of Romans that we can kind of take out of context and, and just kind of throw out there, right? Um, I know that there are a lot of passages, a lot of uh, things that we look at in Romans, and, we, and we'll grab a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here and there, and, and that's all fine and well, and we'll do Bible classes and we'll do sermons and stuff from them. But when you look at the book of Romans, uh, and, of course, we did uh, finish our study in the book of Romans just before COVID hit last year. Um, when you look at the book of Romans and you really start digging in, you really can't uh, separate the context of the entire book from the passages that you look at individually. And so as last week when we were, fin when we were looking at the very last section of chapter 11, we had to start off by understanding uh, what was going on in the congregation at Rome that prompted Paul to write uh, to write to them and to write what he in fact did write? And so we noticed a couple of things here. First, that Paul wrote uh, Romans to a divided congregation that was in turmoil. Now there was nowhere near the amount of turmoil going on in Rome that there was in Corinth, uh, and we we see that uh, there were some disruptions happening because the Jews had left Rome. Uh, because of Nero, and they come back, and the Gentiles had kind of taken over the congregation. They didn't want the Jews back. The Jews wanted to come back. The Jews wanted the Jewish congregation that they had established and left behind. The Gentiles wanted the Gentile congregation that had been established while the Jews were gone, and they were fighting each other. And uh, the, the last part of, of Romans chapter 11, we really understood the fact that Paul is trying to tell them that, uh, that the grace of God had come to all of them because at some point in time, at some point in history, their group, whether it was Jew or Gentile, had been disobedient to the will of God. And they all needed God's grace. So it wasn't the Jews who possessed the congregation. It wasn't the Gentiles who possessed the congregation. It was, in fact, Christ who possessed the congregation. It was the church that belongs to Christ, the church of Christ, right? Um, and, of course, the book of Romans is where we get the, uh, the, name, the name that usually goes on the placards of the doors of our congregations. Um, and so we see here this, this very clear understanding that this grace belonged to Christ. The church belonged to Christ. The people of the church belonged to Christ. All of these things belonged to Christ. And so, excuse me, Paul is trying to point them back in this direction. And he encourages them to work toward unity in the church. And so at the end of chapter 11, we see this, this um, encouragement, this direction for them to get back to the work, to get back to being one body, to get back to understanding that they all belong to Christ and that neither one of them, neither group, uh, had any advantage over the other, that neither group had any authority over the other, that they, in fact, should be one in Christ. And so we see a little bit further uh, in this book, in the book of Romans, after we go past chapter 11 and we get into chapter 12, 
we see the de- that the dedication to Christ and the mindset of Christ was the only way to achieve that. So they had to have the mindset of Christ. They had to become conformed to the image of Christ, which was what they were predestined to do, if you read Romans chapter 8. And they had to understand that they were to take on that mind of Christ so they could take on the work of Christ and they could establish this congregation in Christ and they could bring glory to Christ. And so everything should center around Christ and not what one group or the other wanted. Now again, make no mistake, the problems in Rome don't appear to be anywhere near as bad as the problems in Corinth were, but this rose to the level of Paul needing to intercede so that the folks would get back on the right track. And so Paul writes to them this particular letter, and he mentions here that there are two steps to this process. Now, I'm breaking it down into two steps, even though uh, in a lot of other places throughout the scriptures these steps are kind of mixed, and um, one may come in front of the other in a different location. Uh, But Paul breaks it down for the Romans in Romans chapter 12 into two real major steps here. The first step was to focus on we. It was to focus on us as a group. And the attitude of the congregation, the the behavior of the congregation was extraordinarily important and it was something that we needed to focus on. This was that mindset. You know, I want to tell you, when I first wrote that line and I was looking over this yesterday, I changed the word, uh, I had the word mindset as attitude. I had the word mindset as attitude, but I thought, you know what, that's the wrong word. Because what does attitude typically mean? make you envision now. My kind of swagger toward a situation, right? How, I, how I'm carrying myself, how I'm presenting myself. And, uh, and, you know, we think of somebody having an attitude, that's never a good connotation, is it? Uh, they need to check their attitude, right? Um, so I changed it from attitude to mindset. Because mindset does not just have to do with how I'm presenting myself, with how I am out in front of people and how people perceive me and and whether I'm letting them have it or or this, that, or the other. Mindset is something deeper. Mindset is something that, that goes far, far deeper into who you are and what really motivates you. What, what are your real values? What is really important to you? What does this really mean to you? And not just a, an outward facade, especially of somebody who has a, a bad attitude. This is the mindset of the congregation, the body as a whole, that has to be established in Christ. The second step is to focus on me. Now, when we look at the congregation, we look at the church, the church is not just the building that surrounds us. It is not the building that surrounds us. It's not the four walls and the roof and the electrical and, and, and all of that stuff. The church is us. The church is made up of a bunch of me's, right? Each one of us has a responsibility to the church, and this is the mindset of the Christian. And so we have many members, as Paul is going to say, a little spoiler alert here, we have many members that make up this one body, and the attitude of each individual member contributes to the attitude, to the mindset of the congregation. And so we're going to focus today on the first step, but we have to keep in mind that these must work in tandem. They have to work together. We have to have the right mindset individually, and we have to have the right mindset collectively. And so just because this is the order that Paul puts it in, in chapter 12, we're going to look at the mindset of the we today, of the congregation and the church itself. And so we start off by seeing, when we get into Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that the first part of this appeal is from God and toward God. Now, Paul is going to entreat them. He's going to encourage them. He's going to beseech them um, to have, a, have that right kind of mindset. But this call doesn't just come from God, or from Paul. This call comes from God, and it is a call to move them toward God. We see in verse 1, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, when we look at this, we see this appeal is coming directly from God. And again, as I said, it's moving people toward God. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. Now, what is the very first thing that's indicated by calling them brothers? Brothers and sisters, included here, 
This is to say we are all in the same boat. We are all part of the same family. We are all part of the church that belongs to Christ. And therefore, even though we may be separated by thousands of miles, even though we may be separated by our family's history, even though we may be separated uh, by, by tribe or by nationality, we are all part of the same family. And you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ. And he says, by the mercies of God. Remember what he had said at the end of chapter 11. That all of these things, all of these things, this whole plan of salvation came to us by the grace of God. And now he's, he's petitioning them by the mercies of God. And he wants them to continue to move toward God. He says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice dedicated to God. A sacrifice was something that was brought before the altar in the temple. And in the case of the previous sacrifices, this was something that was slaughtered, that was, that was laid out to be offered on the, burnt, on the altar for the burnt offerings. But in our case, we are to be living sacrifices. We are to give our lives to God and to work for Him and to work toward Him. And that is holy and acceptable to God. Holy means something that is sacred. It's something that is set apart. It is something that has been sanctified. And so we are to be separated from the world and to dedicate ourselves to God, which is our spiritual worship. This is not earthly. That's going to be very, very important because the attitude that had crept into the congregation there at Rome was very much a worldly and earthly attitude. The prejudices of the outside world of Gentile versus Jew, uh, of Greek and barbarian and all those other groups had begun to leak its way into the congregation. And so those worldly attitudes were starting to show up. And so Paul wants them to leave the worldly things behind and to focus on the spiritual. And so we see that our call toward God is a call from God based on what God has done for each one of us. The second thing that we see here is that there is a warning against being worldly. We already had a call toward the spiritual, as I mentioned, away from the worldly. But Paul also wants to warn us and warn the congregation there at Rome against being worldly. In verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is uh, an amazing statement. This is a great memory verse, Terry. If you, ever, if you need a good memory verse, you can't think of one, use Romans 12 too, Because it's absolutely phenomenal. Paul is telling the people of Rome to not be conformed to the likeness of the world around them. And given what we already know about the problems that were going on in Rome, he's not just telling them don't do it, he's telling them what? Stop doing it. Stop looking like the world around you. Stop trying to, to bring those prejudices. Stop trying to bring those thought patterns. Stop trying to bring those behaviors from the world into the place that belongs to God. There is no place for the world in the church. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us if we try to become friends with the world, we make ourselves enemies toward God. And so we have to be transformed. We have to be something different. We have to be something new. And this is our mindset, right? By renewing our mind, by, by taking that bad attitude, that worldly attitude, and throwing it out, and instead replacing it with the proper mindset that belongs to God. And we have to know, we have to understand what the will of God is. And Paul has explained a lot to the Romans by the time we get to chapter 12. He already explained to them about the problem of sin. He, also, he already explained to them the fact that we can become enslaved to sin if we don't turn toward righteousness. He already explained to them the fact that Christ died for us and it was so important that we shouldn't go back to sin after we have become children of God. It's so important that we have to understand that the Jews could be cast out of the will of God. They could, they could deny their place in, the, in God's plan and that the Gentiles could be grafted in. But we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves because we can be cast out as well if we refuse to follow the will of God. And so we need to understand what God's will is. And he describes the will of God as what is good and acceptable and perfect. What's good? Of course, the opposite of what's bad, right? What's acceptable? Not what's acceptable to mankind, but what's acceptable to God. And perfect? 
of course, the flawlessness of God's plan in place, but also the maturity that we have as we grow and we develop and, and we become adults in, <laughs> in dealing with God's plan. I laugh because I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul is having to describe what love means to this congregation that was at war within themselves. And at the end of uh, chapter 13, or toward, toward the end of chapter 13, in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, When I was a child, I thought like a child and I behaved like a child. But now that I have become a man, I put aside my childish ways. Corinthians, you need to grow up. Romans, you need to grow up. Having a worldly mindset, a worldly attitude, is a sign of immaturity. And we have to grow up and we have to grow into all of these things. The third thing that we see here about the attitude or the mindset of the we is that the result of knowing these things and understanding these things should be humility and good judgment within the congregation. Now, we don't like to think about humility. We don't th like to think about people being humble uh, because it has a, a bad connotation, right? I humiliated this person. I humbled this person. I, I, I checked their attitude. You see, that word just pops up over and over again, doesn't it? But instead, we have to have a humble attitude, a humble mindset, especially when it comes toward our relationship with God, because He is, in fact, God. He is, in fact, superior. He is above all. And as we talked about in Bible class uh, the last couple of weeks, He is responsible for creation and our salvation, and we should approach Him with that heart and with that proper mindset. Verse 3 tells us, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, we see a repetition here. Paul, at the end of chapter 11, he warns them not to think of themselves more highly than they ought. Don't think of yourselves uh, too, too uppity. Uh, he's talking to the Gentiles there in chapter 11. He said, because disobedience can fall upon you again too. Don't think that you're going to get away with anything just because the Jews aren't behaving right. It doesn't mean that you can misbehave and get away with it. Comparing yourself to someone else, their behavior is worse than mine, so I should be okay, is a bad, bad idea. Because the standard of judgment is not the worst behavior among mankind. Think about that as a standard of judgment. That's a pretty low standard, right? That's not a real high bar to get across. But our standard of judgment is what God expects from us. And he has already told them in both chapter 3 and in chapter 6 that they have fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of that sin is in fact death, eternal separation. So we should not think of ourselves as being dominant, as being superior, as being better than someone else. And when we have that, uh, that humility in our hearts and in our lives, then our judgment is going to be clear. The idea here of sober is not just the idea of not being drunk. The idea of sober here is the idea of being clear-minded. And I should be clear-minded when I understand what God has done for me and how dependent I am on Him for everything. Just as Paul talks about in his sermon on Mars Hill, he says, in Him we live and move and have our being. And so we understand what need we have uh, uh, to, to rely on God so that we don't think of ourselves as being better than someone else or being better than anyone else for that matter. And he says that we should each make sure that we are exercising that judgment according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And we had a couple of really good points in Bible class this morning about the fact that I only really need that little bitty bit of faith, right? I need that mustard seed faith in order to be uh, uh, pleasing to God, in order to be moving myself toward God. Now that faith sure it grows and it develops over time and over the years as we grow and become more mature. But where do I start? I start with that little bitty bit of faith. And that's enough for me to keep moving forward in the grace and the will of God. And that's only by the grace and the will of God. Paul moves on here. And he tells them also that the body should come together. The body should come together. One of the terrible things about division in the congregation is that the body begins to, to become dysfunctional. When, when a person's physical body starts to, to fail to work properly, or when part of the body starts to fight against another part of the body, 
or whether it's through various diseases or disorders or, or damage due to injury, what do we do? We, take, we go to the doctor, right? We go to the doctor because we recognize very clearly that, hey, this body is not functioning as it should. There's gonna, there are going to be some symptoms. We're not going to feel great or, 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 or we're going to be uh, lethargic or you know, this, that, or the other. Various things can come up and we can see it from the outside that, hey, this body is not working right. What's happening? Well, parts of the body are fighting against one another and it takes the whole body. It takes the whole body to come together. I'll, I'll tell you just a little crazy example. I sharpened a knife last night. You know where this is going, right? And I've got, I've got a little boo-boo on my, on my finger here. And that sharp knife, you, you ever know when that sharp knife hits and you hardly feel it? This wasn't one of those times. I, I, felt, I felt every bit of it. And I jumped, and I almost stepped on the dog, and I started, but as the dogs fall, I'm blaming everything on the dog. And everything I was doing, everything I was doing came to a stop. Why? Because this one little bitty part at the end of one little finger and this little bitty cut caused my body to stop functioning together like it should for just a little while. But the point was still clear and the edge was still very sharp. <laughs> the body has to work together. If I'm going to get anything done, I happen to have been cooking dinner, if I'm going to get dinner fixed, if I'm going to get dinner finished, then everything has to stop. I have to get this taken care of, and then I can get back started again. What did Paul say about this in verses 4 and 5? He said, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. We belong together. We belong together. And each one of us has a job to do. And, and when the one finger stopped functioning for a couple of minutes, and I had to stop and I had to get Ravonda to help put the Band-Aid on because one-handed Band-Aid wasn't real easy, and, and all of this stuff had to, had to come together, everything stopped. But when this was taken care of, when, when that was taken care of and the damage had been mitigated and the, and the band-aid had been put on and then I could get back to work because the body was now working together. And yeah, this finger still hurt just a little bit, but you know what? It had been taken care of. And we could move forward. Now that's a, a small, a slight, a little silly example of what Paul is talking about here. But imagine, if you will, half of the congregation is at war with the other half. Guess what is going to happen within that congregation? Well, none of it's going to be good. They're going to spend all of their time fighting each other and nobody is going to get their job done. And so we all have to work together. We have to stop fighting. We have to cooperate. We have to, we have to be one. Now, thanks be to God, we don't have a lot of internal turmoil here. But we do have a lot of turmoil that's going on around us. And, and we have to work together. We have to continue working together in order to see that turmoil overcome. And moving toward what God wants us to be about. So we individually have to participate in the function of the body. And that's where step two comes in, right? That's where step two that we're going to talk about next week. The attitude, the mindset of me has to come in. And so we continue on. As Paul says, the body should come together so each member can utilize their individual gifts. That involves two things. That involves, one, me recognizing the gifts that I have, and not in an arrogant way, not in a haughty way, not in saying, well, I know this and I'm better, than, better, than this, uh, better at this than you and this, that, and the other. It's not that idea, but God has given us each different talents. He's given us each different spiritual gifts, and and, and worldly gifts in, in a manner of speaking so that we can utilize those toward the glory of God. But we also have to recognize that others have different gifts as well. So I have to recognize it in me, but I also have to recognize it in the we, in the group. And so we each have to utilize these gifts as God has given them to us. In verses, uh, one, uh, verses 8, uh, excuse me, 6 through 8, he says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. 
if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. One of the things that I really like about this list is that at this point in church history, the, the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit were still in effect, but Paul only mentions one of them. The rest of them are non-miraculous gifts that we've been given. And so we can continue looking at these and we can continue uh, working and exercising these. And this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. But look what he says here of prophecy, the, the one miraculous gift in this list, in proportion to our faith. If you have the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit to prophesy, Roman, you go ahead and you do it. But that's not the only thing we can do. Remember, the Corinthians were at war with each other over who had which spiritual gift. And that's why you have 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 written, is to overcome that one problem. But we see here Paul is wanting, them to, wanting to encourage them to use all of the gifts that they've been given in service. What does that mean? That means taking care of somebody else. That means doing something for somebody else. The one who teaches, obvious teaching. How important is that? That is the bedrock of the church. I don't care if you're teaching the little kids or you're teaching the big kids or you're teaching the adults. If you are teaching, you are helping establish the bedrock of the church. I only do a little bit from up here. But everything that we do as far as teaching, that is establishing that bedrock. The one who exhorts. How important is it to encourage one another? Yeah, I saw a lot of eyebrows go up. It's that important. Where would we be without the encouragement that comes from our brothers and sisters in Christ? Where would this congregation be if we didn't have those people who write the cards, who make the phone calls, who, who check up on you, who pat you on the back, who tell you you're doing a good job? I've, I've said this several times. I appreciate it every time somebody mentions me and the work that we're doing here in this congregation by name. That, that helps me. It doesn't, it doesn't just make me feel good that, hey, you know, so-and-so remembered my name. It helps me know and understand that this work is meaningful and it encourages me moving forward. It has nothing to do with ego. It has everything to do with, with encouragement. The one who contributes. Well, we sometimes want to downplay people helping fund the congregation. Sometimes we want to make it, that's what it's all about. But that's not it. It's just one part of something, but it is an important part of something. We can't forget the leadership, the men of the congregation who make these decisions, the congregation with elders and deacons, those decisions that are being made. Those are extraordinarily important, and it can be a very discouraging work. And so their zeal, their enthusiasm for that work is extremely important. And the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So we see all of these things coming together. Each bit, each part, each piece of the congregation works together. And as I said, this list is by no means exhaustive. But they all work together to make a congregation function as it should. And what happens when we're missing one of these pieces? It's like that cut. It brings everything to a halt until it can be taken care of. And sometimes the congregation is unfortunate and has to work without that. But God wants us to work toward being one body in Christ. So what does this mean? This means that, first of all, each congregation has a responsibility to move toward God. We have a responsibility to focus more on the spiritual. We have a responsibility to encourage one another in, in spiritual matters. We have a responsibility to, to teach and learn and understand the Word of God and to know the will of God and to apply that every single day to the functionality, to the work that this congregation is doing. We also have to make sure that we never allow the influence of the world to interfere with our tasks as a congregation. There are places all over the world that are trying to look more and more like the world in order to bring people of the world through their front doors. Now, we don't hang on to the, to the old ways we did things just because we don't want to do that, but we also don't do the opposite. We don't ditch the old ways of doing things just because we want to look more like the world, just because the tradition doesn't seem like it's functioning anymore. We have to look at these things every year, every, every time. Every generation has to struggle with these things, but we want to make sure that we're not letting the world out there 
come and dictate what we do in here. And it's real easy to see the trap that people fall into. Yes, they may be filling the, filling the building up with people, but are they focusing on the spiritual rather than the worldly? Number three, we should make sure we stay humble and know that it is the grace of God that saves us. It's nothing that we do. This church does not belong to us. I said that last week. I'll say it this week, and I'll say it again next week. The church does not belong to us. We are the church, and we belong to Christ. And it is only through His grace that allows us to, uh, to be part of it. We also see here that the body of Christ, the church, must come together as one body. Just like I said, we have all of these parts, we have all of these pieces that need to come together. They need to work in concert to make sure that the work of this church continues to happen and the salvation of the members of this congregation remains secure to the best of our ability. That has to happen. And this has to happen so that each one of us can do the work of the church by utilizing our own gifts. We have to make certain that we recognize the gifts that we have. We're going to talk more about that next week. But we also need to make certain that each person has an opportunity to utilize those gifts for the kingdom of God. If you've got, a, if you've got an ability, if you've got a capability that, that will serve a purpose in the kingdom of God and you're not being given an opportunity to, to utilize that, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to get discouraged. You're going to fade away. We need to make sure that everybody is pointed in the right direction and is able to do what they're capable of doing, even if right now they don't know that they're capable of it. There's some places, uh, some opportunities to learn and to grow and to develop new skills and new gifts, but we have to make sure everybody is able to utilize them. And finally, we need to understand that this leads us to our personal responsibility to the church and to God, which we're going to talk about next week. So I thank you, everybody, this morning for, um, uh, for hearing what God has to say, what Paul has written to the Romans on this. And I want to leave you with the invitation to, um, to become uh, part of the church. If you are not yet a Christian, if you are not yet a child of God, and you've not yet um, obeyed the gospel, I want to let you know that the gospel message stands ready for you. If you're here this morning and you have heard the word of God proclaimed, and you believe that Christ is the living Son, of the eternal God and that he died for your sins and you are ready and willing to confess Christ's name before men and to repent of your sins then you can be baptized in order to have those sins washed away but the gospel message also calls each one of us who are already in Christ because sometimes we fall short of that glory again and sometimes it's to the point where we've allowed the world or anything of the world or, or personal sin to come between us and our Heavenly Father and we are called to repent of that sin as well so if you're here today and you need to be baptized to have your sins washed away, or if you need to repent of a sin that has separated you from your Heavenly Father again, have an opportunity to do so. If you have any of those spiritual needs, why don't you come and meet me up front as together we stand and sing our invitation song.